thank you so much for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you. I'm going to run through uh, this in a, in a big hurry, quite frankly. Um, I don't purport to be sharing anything with anybody in this room that I don't think you probably already know. This is more of a, of a, of a synthesis and a perspective sharing than, than education. So I'd just like to start with a thought experiment, though, and that is uh, a bathtub. Uh, imagine your bathtub. When, when you want water in the bathtub, you have two knobs, two dials. You control the rate, the volume, the flow into the tub. When you want the water out of the tub, there's a drain. The water goes away. Very simple, very straightforward. But let's think about what happens to the water when it leaves our tub. Well, it enters the slightly more complicated municipal infrastructure where it's treated, it's discharged, ultimately has an impact on the local ecology. Ultimately, that water is going to go play a role in the larger uh, planetary hydrological cycle. It's going to be probably be treated again. That water is probably going to end up in someone else's bathtub. Maybe a molecule or two in yours. You never know. But we could zoom out of that even farther, and we could think about some of the larger systemic things attached to it. So at this level, we start thinking about uh, the mining for the materials to make the pipe to deliver the water. We start thinking about the economic situation affecting energy costs that you're paying to heat the water, um, political ramifications uh, influencing the regulations and policies driving all of this, right? So this is obviously illustrated, obviously not exhaustive, but the point is your bathtub is not as simple as you think it is. It's a part of, it's one little node in a much larger interconnected complex system. All right, so that's your actual bathtub. Now let's use the bathtub as a analogy. And let's say our bathtub uh, represents, um, or let's say the contents of the bathtub, of the bathtub represents the number of people in London who uh, are living in poverty. And we, how we define poverty, that's another thing. We hopefully have time to get to that. Um, but that's what the bathtub is. We are now working with an analogy. And so water comes into your bathtub in very obvious ways. It's got faucets, but how do, how do people end up in our metaphorical bathtub of poverty? What is that? That is complex, basically incomprehensible, uh, oh, virtually inscrutable, uh, and of course, illustrative only. The, the point here is that by the time someone uh, enters this uh, realm, this definition of poverty, they have been a part of a confluence of various factors. And these are so uh, intimately personal and unique for each uh, individual. We're, of course, interested in how people leave. Uh, how do people exit? And so we have our programs, our interventions, uh, our, our various programs of, of various kinds. But like our bathtub, if we zoom out from this again, we see that uh, these things are all interconnected with, our, with the political economy, with the environment, with our geography, with our, like you, you can see, they're, to say that there's lines of non-relation between these becomes very arbitrary because eventually we can see kind of the knock-on effects of anything kind of across the board. So the, from a systems standpoint, from an interrelated standpoint like this, uh, I propose the question to ask uh, as a panel is where, where do you intervene? Where in this array of interrelated, interdependent, codependent variables do you choose to try to make a difference? So I'm drawing largely from the work of Danella Meadows here, a systems, environmental systems theorist. So these are a couple uh, intervention points. You got constants, parameters, and numbers. Um, this is kind of the, this is kind of like just trying to figure out how to turn the dial, uh, turn the faucet on the bathtub. Um, and these are, these are the kind of things that when we initially say we want to change something in society, we go right to little numbers and knobs that we can twist and adjust. Uh, so those for us, like, in the poverty context have a lot to do with like funding structures, policies. We want to just kind of direct or redirect some flow of resources one way or another. Uh, we can look at regulating negative feedback loops. And sorry for the jargon. By a negative feedback loop, um, basically we're saying those are self-correcting mechanisms within a system. So your thermostat is a negative feedback loop. It acts in response to a discrepancy between the actual temperature of the room and the desired temperature of the room. And when those don't match, that's a negative trigger that turns on your furnace. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, negative feedback loops in, in, in this system. Uh, affordable housing, for instance. I'm not saying affordable housing is negative. <laughs> like, affordable housing is great. Your thermostat is great. These are good things. But 
affordable housing is reacting to. It's a self-regulating mechanism of the system. You're regulating to a need, which is there's not enough people who can afford housing at market rent. So it reacts to that. It's like a thermostat. Uh, healthcare, technically, we could say healthcare is a negative feedback loop too. Healthcare is good, <laughs> but it's a negative feedback loop in the sense that it's self-correcting. You have immunizations, we have antibiotics, we have medicine, like all these things exist to balance a deficiency in the system. Uh, we have, um, we could drive positive feedback, drive positive feedback loop. So a positive feedback loop is anything that the more of it you have, the more of it you get. So if you're, if you're uh, wealthy, you invest money, you make interest, you have an interest, you have more money to invest, so you invest more, you get more wealthy around and around. If you're poor, you're probably paying interest. So, you're, so the more interest you pay, the less money you have, the poorer you get, the more interest you pay. Positive feedback loop. So we have some that we can intervene in in the system, such as the job market, for instance. The more people you have working, the more people you have to buy things. The more people can buy things, the more people can work, theoretically. Education, the more knowledge you generate, the more learning you inspire, the more learning you inspire, the more knowledge you generate. The positive feedback loops. Both positive and negative feedback loops can be good. They can also be bad, like a virus is a positive feedback loop, right? Uh, structure of information flows. Um, when you're driving down the highway, and there's a big sign across the freeway that says, uh, you know, there's this amount of congestion past the next five inter uh, exchanges. That allows the system to self-correct itself. So by putting that sign across the road, you're not adding any roads. You're you're not adjusting anything other than sharing information. Oh, uh, some people say that like, if you take your um, if you take the uh, hydrometer from your house, from you know, it's buried along the side of the house, and you put it in your front hallway every time you walk in your house. You're going to look at your, your electric meter. Um, that studies show that reduces energy consumption by about 30%. So you don't change the rate of energy. You don't change, change the price of electricity. You've just created feedback where information is shared differently within the system. So there's options like that. Uh, the rules of the system. So these are the... Um, these are the incentives and the punishments <laughs> that the system uh, can operate. There's massive amounts of inertia behind uh, these nodes. They're very established. Uh, they're very hard to change, but if you change their trajectory <coughs> slightly, they can have very large knock-on effects throughout the whole system. Uh, the goals of the system, now we're getting kind of even more, uh, even more high level. Uh, if you change what people believe about who they are and who they are individually and who they are collectively, uh, then the, the capacity for the system to evolve and change on its own. We're getting pretty high in the, high in the head here. You've got the mindset or paradigm of the system. Um, so I just show you this kind of this silly little graph here. You might say this, this is nice, but it, well, you might say instead, uh, no, I think there's one root cause of poverty. Uh, I would say, well, you want to think that, but I think that's kind of ridiculous. But the point is that... Um, the way we think about the system and the paradigm of the system is going to drastically impact the way we think about addressing it. So you change the way people think about addressing the system and that can have larger changes. Um, so this list right here is um, some system theorists, such as Donella Meadows, so I'm drawing this from, would say that this is hierarchical in that the things near the top, the closer you are to the top of this list, the easier those things are to change and the less impact they have system-wide. So turn some dials, turn some knobs. Those things are easy because you can get another committee or some group of people to vote yes and push it through. Easy, again, easy in air quotes. Uh, you get to the bottom of the list and you're talking about uh, things that are extremely challenging, uh, very hard to do, but have very large systemic influence across, across the whole system. Um, so just a few uh, thoughts. These are not recommendations is the wrong word. These are just some, some thoughts. I. I'd leave with you for your contemplation as a panel. Um, first of all, having a really concise definition of, of, what, of what is in the bathtub. What are we trying to do here? Uh, in one sense, um, uh, poverty doesn't exist. It's not an absolute thing, right? It, it's defined by the culture and the society defining it. Uh, so if we say we're going to end poverty uh, in a year, uh, the definition of poverty, that's Another generation is going to be defining it different because I come from a history background and I can tell you that this is a very loose definition that's evolving through time. Um, so what, what can we change though, or we can look to change our, um, our measurables. So 
what's in the bathtub? Is the bathtub the number of people on a waiting list, the number of people in shelters? Uh, what is the number that we can measure now, five years, 10 years, 50 years, and see? So, so we're zooming into the tub and then we're zooming out to the system. Uh, remembering, and I think this is probably the key, one of the key points, is that the system is nonlinear. And it's the nonlinearity of the system. If I can make one point, I think this would probably be it. Um, that what, what you do on the output affects what you do on the input, like your bathtub. So when British, in British ruled India, there were cobras everywhere uh, bugging the British people. And so they were like, let's get rid of the cobras. So they put a bounty on the cobras. And then all these people who were very poor decided to start farming cobras, a little underground cobra farming industry, uh, chopping off the heads and then bringing them for the bounty. And then what happens? Well, the government's like, the British government's like, well, we're sick of just paying for cobras. <laughs> uh, so they take away the brand, and all the very disgruntled underground cobra farmers let all their cobras go. And at the end, you've got an exponentially greater cobra problem at the end than you do at the beginning, right? This is why, this is why when you uh, create the prohibition, you end up creating the mafia. This is why when you try to build walls to deal with immigration conflicts, you end up with greater refugee crises. This is why when you bomb terrorists and insurgents, you get more terrorism and more insurgency. The point is the nonlinearity. It's not a straight line. There's not any one arrow going one direction. What you put out comes back in. And then finally, I uh, propose that the, um, the purpose and the narratives about the system itself, going back to that list, uh, really create the greatest opportunities for system change. They're the hardest opportunities for system change. But if we want to think about poverty uh, systemically, poverty as a whole, uh, I, I, I'd encourage you as a committee not just, not just to think about recommendations that tweak knobs and dials, uh, but to explore kind of some of those larger transcendent perspectives uh, that, uh, that can be taken into consideration too. So there's uh, some resources that I found very helpful in, in my thinking. And, uh, and that's my talk. That usually takes a lot longer. <laughs>